Hello everyone. Today, we're starting a new series that's a deep dive into my favorite book, The Ancestor's Tale, by Richard Dawkins and Yan Wong. So, let's jump right in. <laughs> First, a disclaimer. This series is not endorsing anything Dawkins has said outside this book. This series is only concerned with the contents of the book. With that out of the way, what are our intentions with this series? We are going to investigate each of the tales in The Ancestor's Tale and, where applicable, we are also going to look at new developments relevant to the chapter. If you're unaware, in this book, rather than going forward, Dawkins and Wong travel backwards through time meeting our ever more distant relatives as they go. Throughout the book, the authors recount various organisms' tales, analogous to Geoffrey Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, in which the organisms serve as a jumping-off point for describing some concept in evolutionary biology, whether it be encephalization quotients, molecular clocks, sexual dimorphism, etc. My hope with this series is to garner interest in this book, my favorite book, as well as to marvel at the fascinating evolutionary histories of various organisms. Now, without further ado, let's get to the first tale, the Tasmanian's Tale. This tale is about the common ancestry of all living humans. If this tale is about the shared ancestry of all living humans, then why is Tasmanian in the title? The authors begin the tale by describing how researchers calculate how far back in time one would have to go to find the common ancestor of a population. The more astute viewers might suspect that the authors applied this sort of calculation to, say, the indigenous people of Tasmania, and you would be right. The authors use Tasmanians to illustrate a calculation in coalescent theory. Think of coalescence as tracing two lineages backwards until they coalesce in a most recent common ancestor. So, how do we apply this to Tasmanians? Coalescent theory encompasses the various types of calculations we can perform to figure out how long ago this ancestor lived. So, humans first arrived in Tasmania around 42,000 years ago via the proposed land bridge known as the Bassian Isthmus, which stretched from Australia to Tasmania. Today, of course, there is no land bridge. A body of water known as the Bass Strait is situated between the islands. Since at least 1904, researchers have hinted at the existence of the Bassian Isthmus, and some researchers have even argued that the formation of the Isthmus split populations of marine organisms, such as the greenback flounder Rhombosolia taparina. The land bridge could also explain the abrupt split between the biogeographical distribution of the snails Nerida atramentosa and Nerida melanotragus. Regardless, Tasmanians were theoretically isolated from other human populations for between 9,000 and 12,000 years. Europeans started showing up in Tasmania in the 1800s, thus ending the Tasmanians' isolation. So, we'll assume the present year is 1800 AD. Now, on to the calculations. For ease of calculation, we're going to make a few assumptions. For starters, some researchers have estimated that the population of Tasmanians was at about 5,000 individuals before Europeans arrived, so we're going to assume that the population has been a static 5,000 individuals. We're also going to assume that mating is random in the population, as is generally assumed by mathematicians who perform similar calculations. Obviously, that's an unreal expectation, but as previously stated, these assumptions are making our calculations easier. Ease of calculation is very much appreciated here at Jackson Weed Incorporated because none of us are population geneticists. If we take the calculations of population geneticist Joseph Chang outlined in the 1999 paper, Recent Common Ancestors of All Present-Day Individuals, then we find that the most recent common ancestor of those 5,000 Tasmanians lived only 12 generations ago. Given that a single century can see three or more generations within a lineage, that means the common ancestor of all Tasmanians lived at most four centuries ago in 1400 AD. That seems surprisingly recent, but it makes sense if you think about it. For starters, you can't have more ancestors alive at any given time than there are members of a population. You have two parents, 
four grandparents, eight great-grandparents, and so on. At 13 generations, you now have 8,192 ancestors, which is more than the number of individuals in our assumed population. Of course, you're not the only person in the population. There are other people in this population, and they share lineages with you to some extent. If you have a brother or sister, then they share the entire lineage with you. A first cousin shares less ancestry with you, a second cousin less than that, and so on. So it's less about the number of ancestors you have and more about the number of lineages that can be traced back to a single ancestor. To do this, we must figure out how many times 2 can be multiplied by itself to equal the population size. The reason we use 2 is that humans are diploid. We get one set of chromosomes from our mother and one set from our father. In math terms, the operation we're performing is called a base 2 logarithm. Thus, we take the base 2 logarithm of 5000 and get about 12.3 generations, which we can round down to 12 generations. If that's not weird enough, things are about to get weirder. For any population, or any two individuals, all the individuals can be traced back to a single common ancestor, the most recent common ancestor, or MRCA. Logically, all the parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, and so forth of that common ancestor are also necessarily common ancestors. According to the Chang paper, quote, Eventually, in a given generation, many, and in fact most, of the individuals will be common ancestors. At some point, we reach a generation in which some individuals are common ancestors, having all present-day individuals as descendants, and some are extinct, having no present-day individuals as descendants. But no individual is intermediate, having some, but not all, present-day individuals as descendants. That is, at this point, everyone who is not extinct is a common ancestor. This condition persists forever as we trace back in time. Every individual is a common ancestor or extinct. Close quote. This is called the identical ancestors point. Evidently, the time required to go from that most recent common ancestor to everyone either being a common ancestor or not isn't long at all. It's only 1.77 times older than that most recent common ancestor is. If we multiply 1.77 by 12.3 generations, then we get just about 22 generations, or at most, about seven centuries ago in 1100 AD. That still seems really recent. Now, you might be wondering, well, what if we applied this calculation to the whole of humanity? It's doable mathematically, but functionally useless. Remember, this calculation assumes the entire population has been mating at random the entire time. As Chang and colleagues point out in a later 2004 paper, quote, mating patterns are structured by geography, proximity, culture, language, and social class, close quote. But to satisfy your curiosity, the base 2 logarithm of 7 billion is almost 33 generations, which would only place us at most 11 centuries back from today. By this crude calculation, the common ancestor of the entire world population therefore lived around 900 AD in the medieval period. Obviously, that's ridiculous. Of course, mathematicians recognize that's a misuse of the equation. It's sort of like trying to use your dishwasher to clean your car. And since, as we mentioned earlier, the Tasmanians have been effectively isolated for over 9,000 years, the common ancestor of all living humans couldn't logically have lived less than 9,000 years ago. That later paper by Chang et al., modeling the recent common ancestry of all living humans, does attempt to make a slightly more realistic model of human common ancestry. Under that model, one migration event is allowed between populations per generation. From there, the researchers calculate that the most recent common ancestor of all living humans lived around the year 300 BC. Of course, the researchers acknowledge the calculation, quote, was motivated more by considerations of theoretical insight and tractability than by realism, close quote. An interesting result of the study, though, was that the most recent common ancestor would probably have lived in Eastern Asia, likely due to its proximity to Eurasia, the Americas, and the Pacific Islands, allowing the descendants of that common ancestor to reach many locations rather quickly.
such recent dates could be rather confusing to some. After all, the most famous dates for most recent common ancestors of humans are estimated in the multiples of hundreds of thousands of years, given for the matrilineal mitochondrial most recent common ancestor and patrilineal Y chromosome most recent common ancestor, more famously known by their misnomers mitochondrial Eve and Y chromosomal Adam, respectively. The reason why these have far older dates is rather simple. No matter how far back you go, you only have one matrilineal and one patrilineal ancestor, whereas the total ancestors you have doubles every generation. Because of this, there are way more ways to share common ancestry with other people outside the patrilineal and matrilineal lines, and consequently, the most recent common ancestor has to be much more recent than the Y chromosomal Adam and mitochondrial Eve. We'll have much more to say about her later in Eve's tale. Thus, the 300 BC date could actually be true, but with caveats. For one thing, we're assuming there are no genetically isolated populations anywhere on Earth. And in fact, with regard to the Tasmanians, there are no more genetically isolated Tasmanians. Factoring in isolated populations without immigration would, of course, result in much older common ancestry dates. With regard to non-isolated populations, the story is different. For example, all European monarchs are direct descendants of both William the Conqueror and Charlemagne. Charlemagne lived as recently as 748 to 814 AD. How many Americans can trace their ancestry back to just George Washington? More interestingly, how many of us are descendants of Muhammad, or Nebuchadnezzar, or the builders of Stonehenge? In addition to the previous simplistic calculation, Chang et al. modeled the more complex dynamics of human subpopulations in a computer simulation, wherein the world's inhabited landmasses are simplified into three levels of substructure, continents, countries, and towns. Assuming a realistic migratory behavior of humans within these areas, the simulation predicts a mean date of 1415 BC for the most recent common ancestor of all humans alive today. Not as close as 300 BC, but still very recent. And even then, the authors point out that this simulation is rather conservative about the migratory rates of humans. If these rates are simulated slightly higher, the mean date for most recent common ancestor could be as recent as 55 CE. For the identical ancestors point, the predicted mean dates are 5353 BC and 2158 BC, respectively, for the simulations with different migratory rates. Although the authors discuss several factors that could make the true dates very different compared to their model, particularly the potential existence of groups that were isolated for a long time, like the Tasmanians being isolated from the flooding of the Bass Strait 9,000 to 12,000 years ago, as previously mentioned. But they point out that even among Tasmanians, there is likely no remaining native without some non-native ancestry. Even in regard to the Bering Strait that separates the continents of Eurasia and the Americas, populations on either side appear to have exchanged mates throughout archaeological history. And even if the migratory rates across such bottlenecks were very infrequent, it wouldn't affect the predicted dates by that much, only by a few hundred years. It isn't possible to precisely determine these dates, but all considered, we can draw some general conclusions. The most recent common ancestor of all humans, assuming there are no longer any genetically isolated populations, may only have lived a few thousand years ago. That common ancestor is likely not to have lived in Africa, which seems strange given that Africa is the birthplace of our species. Secondly, just a few thousand years before that, we all share the exact same set of ancestors. Bear in mind that at this time humans had lived on every corner of the globe for a very long time. The implication of this fact is that everyone on this planet, including you viewers out there, have ancestors from every continent. As the Chang et al. paper concludes, quote, No matter the languages we speak or the color of our skin, we share ancestors who planted rice on the banks of the Yangtze, who first domesticated horses on the steppes of the Ukraine, who hunted giant sloths in the forest of North and South America, and who labored to build the Great Pyramid of Khufu, close quote. This is a consequence of using genealogy, rather than genes, to trace our ancestry. We will trace our genetic ancestry in a later tale, so stay tuned for that. So, thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.